chose to not follow what God has for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We can know, we can know for sure without a shadow of a doubt that we are born again and that we are bound for heaven if we choose to believe what God's word has to say. You know, just by living a good life or doing good things isn't going to get you to heaven. It's our choice of what we're going to do with Jesus Christ, whether we're going to accept him or reject him. And I made a couple points, and that is to be almost saved is to be totally lost. You know, I'm almost there. Maybe someday. Uh, no, no, there's no, there's no almost. There's either, it's either all or none. God grades on the cross, not on the curse. He grades by what we've done with the cross of Calvary, whether we've accepted or rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, point number one is what we can know about the will of God is, first of all, you must be born again. Secondly, to be spirit-filled. And uh, there's a lot of people in the world today say, oh, I, I need more of the Spirit. No. No, as soon as you're born again, as soon as you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you have as much of the Holy Spirit as you'll ever get. I have as much of the Holy Spirit the day that I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior on June 13th, 1976. That day, I received as much of the Holy Spirit as I'll ever get. The question is, is how much of the Holy Spirit that I allow to take control of me? It's not how much of the Holy Spirit I get, but how much He gets of me. To be all His. Not to have a little corner here that says, you know, God, you can have every part of my life except for this little corner over here. That's my pet sin, and I'm going to keep it. I'm going to hold on to it. You know, He wants every part of us. Every part of us. He who is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. And how about this one? Give God what is right not what's left. Give them all, not just a part. And never give the devil a ride. He will always want to drive. <laughs> and isn't that true? You give him a ride, he, he's going to want to drive. Give Satan an inch, and he will become a ruler. He'll want to take control and do it all. But not only you must be born again, spirit-filled, but also set apart. Set apart, just like our toothbrush is set apart for one purpose, to brush our teeth. Well, God has set us aside for one purpose, to glorify Him. He wants us to be vessels that He can use. And you know, just like that vessel that needs to be polished a little bit and cleaned up and worked with, that's true in our lives as well. To be vessels to please and glorify God. But a vessel that's all dirty and speckled and and not where God wants us to be. He can't use us. He wants us to be set apart. Forbidden fruit creates many jams. <laughs> and it does. It does. We don't want to be in a jam. We want to be where God wants us to be. And don't put a question mark where God puts a period. And then number four is law abiding. You know, it's kind of hard to be a witness when we can't even keep the, the law of the land. To be faithful, and even though we might think, well, that's a stupid law, but it's there for a purpose. God has uh, set them over this country to, to set up those laws for a purpose, to, to be faithful and to abide by the rules. You know, it's kind of hard to play a game when everybody at the table has different rules and want to do it their own way. You know, it's kind of hard to play a game that way when the rules are kind of changed, you know. And especially some people like to change the rules <laughs> just at the right time where it where it gives them the advantage, right? Now, we want to know the rules up front and uh, be right there uh, where, where everything is the way it should be and we keep the law of the land. And then number five, faithfully committed. You know, sometimes we go through struggles. Sometimes we go through trials. You know, a lot of kneeling will keep you in good standing. To be on our knees. To seek his direction because so often we go through struggles, we go through trials that just tear us apart. Tears begin to flow. But even in the midst of those tears, there's an inward joy that the world just doesn't understand. An inward joy that we can count on the Lord Jesus Christ. I like this one here. Worry is the dark room in which negatives are developed. Yeah, so often it's easy to be worried. Be worried. Worry. <laughs> To, to worry about something, it's easy to do that. 
but it takes a lot of strength to say, well, God will help me through. He will get me through it, and I can do this. God promises a safe landing, but not a calm passage. Sometimes our way doesn't is not as calm as we would like it to be. But the landing is going to be beautiful. We know what's coming. We know what's ahead. We know that Christ is in control. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father on high. And one day the world's going to be his footstool. His enemies will be defeated. They will be destroyed. And our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at to be spirit-filled. To be used of God. In, in Judges chapter 6, look at verse 34, the beginning. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Gideon was a man who God used in a marvelous way. Let's look at the story today and uh, what it was about Gideon that God used. We, we looked at uh, the uh, church here this morning and, and how everybody in the church has a purpose in, during the Sunday school hour. And uh, we learned that God does not always call the qualified, but he qualifies the willing he qualifies those who are willing to say, hey, here am I, use me. He doesn't always call those who are the most qualified. People who think, oh, man, they are really do well. I mean, that person, he, he would do, uh, but, you know, a lot of times those people that we think are the most qualified, they're not interested in being used of God, not interested in being where God wants them to be. But here in Judges chapter 6, let's look at verse 1. In Judges chapter 6, it says this, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, that's kind of unique. I don't remember that ever happening to you. Yeah, they were always, always falling into sin, weren't they? You know, in fact, the book of Judges is kind of like a whirlwind because they just kept going in circles. They, they would come to the point where they repent and God uses them and they're living for the Lord, maybe 60 years, 70 years. But then, then these foreign gods come in like Baal and Buddha and, and not Buddha, but, but all these gods of the grove and, and they begin to worship them and they turn their back upon the Lord and turn their back upon God. And, and so, so God says, well, I got to get a hold of their attention. You know, it's kind of like a, a little child, a toddler. When they do things that they're not supposed to do, you tell them, no, don't touch that. You're going to break it. Or, or no, don't touch that. It's hot. <laughs> you know, so, so you slap their little hand and, and you tell them, no. You, you, you kind of issue a little bit of pain to get a hold of their attention and let them know, no, don't touch that. You're, you're either going to break it or it's too hot. Or, or you get a hold of their attention like a good parent would. And so that's what God did. God sent in these, these nations to get a hold of Israel's attention. Like the Philistines, the Midianites, the, the Melchites, the children of the east. And, and all these nations would come in and, and they would torment Israel. They would either take their food or they would turn them into slaves or, or, or they would do things to get their attention. And what Israel would do is they would cry out to the Lord. We see our sin. We see we're not where we need to be. Please send a deliverer. So what did God do? He sent deliverers like Samson, Deborah, Gideon, other judges throughout the book to come and deliver Israel. And after God delivers them, there's once again peace. They're, they're serving the one true God. But then after a while, they go right back into that, that worldly decisions and fall back into sin. And, and again, it starts all over again. God has to discipline them and get a hold of their attention. And, and so here we are in verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And what did he do? And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And it says, and, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth destroyed all their food till thou comest unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor, nor ass. He just took them all. 
and they came up with their cattle and their tents, and, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their cattle. Their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Oh, Israel was weeping. They were hiding in caves and thresholds and, and knowing that, that, that it's going to be destruction and, 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 and no food, no home. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the many nights, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So what did God do? He sent a deliverer. His name was Gideon. He was a member of the smallest tribe of Israel. He happened to be the youngest one in his family. And I'm sure he thought, well, God can't use me. <laughs> me? Who, me? And, you know, I can almost see as the angel spoke to Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. He was probably standing there at the threshing floor, looking around to see who is he talking why is he talking to me? Who, me? Uh, you probably felt that way because Gideon did not feel like he was the qualified one. Didn't feel like he was the one to do the job. But the Lord came upon him in verse 34. We know the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and God told him, I want you to go down and tear down the idols of Baal. Get the Midianites' attention. Oh, it made them angry for sure. They even came to Gideon's father and, and, and found out, hey, this is Gideon who did this. And they said, well, you bring Gideon because we're going to take his life. And But they were wise. They looked at this, this mob, this crowd, and said, well, you know, why, do, why doesn't Baal take care of his own problems? I mean, if he is really the true and living God, he, he'll take care of it himself. Well, that kind of pleased those who worship Baal and said, yep, okay, Baal will do his own job. He will do it himself. Well, Gideon again had questions, remember? Gideon began to wonder, am I really the one for the job? Am I really the one that God does truly want to use? And so we know that Gideon put out the fleece, right? Many of us have heard about the fleece and, and many messages about it. He put out the fleece and said, Lord, if the fleece is all wet and I can wring it out, but it's dry on the ground, I know it's your will for me to do this. And that's what happened. And he again questioned, said, you know, hey, that, you know, that's science. <laughs> Remember, we got to follow science, right? Of course, that's what's going to happen. And he said, well, don't be upset with me. I'm going to ask one more time. And he said, why don't you make the ground wet and the fleece dry? And then Gideon knew God was about to do something. He even gave a sacrifice. And God accepted that sacrifice. Remember, it, it burned all up and went into heaven. And, and he knew, yep, this is of God. This is not just some man trying to tell me this. This is the Lord. And, and I need to listen and, and find out what's going on. So Gideon, when he finally realized that he's the man for the job, he begins to put together an army. And we're going to look at the crowds of compromise. The crowds of compromise. You know, the Bible tells us that Gideon gathered together 32,000 men. 32,000. And I've often wondered, you know, there's probably over 100,000 or 130,000 in each tribe. There's a whole lot more than just 132,000, I mean 32,000, just 32,000. That's all that came for this battle? You know, there's a lot of compromise going on. A lot of people in Israel that thought, no, let, well, let's just follow what they're saying, you know. It's a lot easier just to do what the Midianites tell us and the Amalekites and, and just not cause any waves, you know. Let, let's just kind of follow what they've got to say. Just like the world around us today saying, Let, let's just follow the world. It's just so much easier to go downstream and listen to what the world has to say and, and just just do whatever they're going to, you know. It, just, it would just be a lot less problems, right? That's the opposite way that God wants us to go. He doesn't want us just to follow the stream of the world and believe whatever the world says and whatever science tries to tell us, you know, this is it. You know, science changes every day. 
You know, they change their ideas, and a lot of times when they finally figure it out, it's exactly what the Word of God's been telling us all along, right? 32,000? That's it? That's all? Oh, lots of compromise. A lot of people thinking, you know, we don't want to get involved. We, we don't want to get involved in what God is doing. We, we're just kind of sit back. But Gideon gathered to the other 32,000 men. Kind of gives me the idea that there are many out there who reject the Lord and what God has. There's also Christians not willing to live for the Lord. Not willing to get involved. Not willing to jump in and, and say, hey, you know, we're going to make a difference. We're, we're, we're going to take a stand for what's right and what's true. We're, we're tired of the world binding us and this, the, these Midianites and Amalekites and children of the East using this opportunity to enslave us. We want to be free. We want to be free to worship the God that we believe is the true and living God. But yet there's Christians out there willing no desire to live for the Lord. No desire to be involved. No desire to jump in. Only 32,000 men. Maybe there are some that were too busy to get involved. Too many things going on. Too busy to, to be involved in what God was about to do. Kind of reminds me of today. There's a lot of people that are too busy to be a part of the local church. Too busy to be involved. Too too busy to, to, to do and be where God wants us to be, to grow spiritually, to, to live a life while pleasing and glorifying to God. Only 32,000 men? That's all? That's it? Out of millions of people? How sad. You know, we think all oh, the Old Testament's not relevant. Certainly sounds very relevant for us today on how our churches are closing. How people aren't interested in the things of God. Not interested in what God is about to do. I don't want to be involved. I'd rather be doing other things. Other things than being involved in what God is about to do. Not interested. Not involved. Not interested in what God is about to do. 32,000 men. But you know as you look at this crowd of compromise. We not only want to look at the crowd of com compromise but also in the valley of fear. Because out of those 32,000 men, God told Gideon, you have too many. Let them know whoever is too scared, too fearful, too afraid to fight this battle, they can go home. So the Bible shares with us in Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, listen to this. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morai in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give to the, to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people, listen to this, 20 and 2,000. And there remained 10,000. So Gideon was able to gather 32,000 men in his army. But 22,000 decided to leave. Why? Because they were afraid. They were dominated by fear. They were fearful of the world around them. And you know, there are many people today who are fearful. Who are afraid. I don't want to get involved in what God's doing. There are lots that are afraid. What others might think. What others might say. Christians afraid of things like witnessing and telling other people about Christ. They were dominated by fear. As believers, we, we do not need to be fearful. In fact, the word of God shares with us that greater is he that's in the world than, or greater is he that, that is, is in them than he that is in the world. We don't have to be fearful. We can trust in what God has done and, and in his mighty hand. 
For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Only 32,000? And out of those 32,000, 22,000 men went home. Why? Because they're afraid. It wasn't given to them by God. That was a fear of the unknown. A fear of, of what's about to happen. A fear of the world. A fear of the hold of Satan that dominated them. Pulled them apart and pulled them from the true and living God. They were fearful. Dominated by fear. Fear was so a big part of their lives that they didn't get involved in what God was about to do. God was about to do something wonderful. Something that was going to change the lives of Israel. He was about to do something that would get a hold of the world's attention. Because he is the true and living God. Don't be dominated by fear. Don't allow fear to pull you away from the blessings and the privilege of serving the Lord. And being right there where God wants us to be. Israel. Only 32,000 men. And 22,000 of them left because of fear. Not interested in being a part of what God was about to do. But we also not only want to look at the fact they're dominated by fear. But there are also others who were characterized by carelessness. God again told Gideon. You know, I, I want people to praise my name. I don't want Israel to think that, that it was through their strength. I, I want them to know that God did this. And so I want you to give Israel a test. You know, tests, those don't sound very good. I mean, about this time at school, we're many that are getting tests. And some people get a little bit afraid of that. But this is a simple test. Now, now I know that's an oxymoron. But this was really a simple test. All they had to do is go down to a stream and get a drink of water. That's it. And those who, who bent over and drank the water from the stream were those who were to go home. But those who picked up the water in their hands and lapped the water out of their hands were the 300 men who stayed. Now the trick here is that those who bent over and drank the water from the stream were a little careless. I mean, that's a dangerous move. You know, when you see animals coming, they're alert. They're watching because there might be an alligator in the water or there might be a predator next door or, or something. They are alert and on high alert. But to bend over and drink the water from the stream, not being very wise. It's a little bit careless. But those who picked the water up in their hand and was alert and looking around and seeing what's going on, that's the ones that God used. He picked those 300 men for the battle, to fight the battle, and to win it for the glory of God. They were alert. They weren't careless. And you know, we have people in this world today who are very careless, not interested in what God's word has to say careless with the world around us and, and what people have to say and, and, and what's going on and, and uh, not interested in the things of God. Did you know that sometimes a backslidden Christian is like an old car? They begin to miss before they stop altogether. You know, even children, sometimes they come to church because mom and dad tells them to come to church. But then after they're grown and out of the house, they don't come back anymore. They're gone because they're not interested in the things of God. And you know, that just breaks my heart to think that somebody that has grown up in the local church and, and has been faithful because mom and dad's faithful, but then after they leave home and, and they have their own families, they just leave church altogether. Something was missing. Something was missing. And you know, it's not always the church, but it's the heart. It's the heart, the desire to be involved and to be active in, in what God is doing. Here we have Gideon, who is gathering together these people, 
hoping that somebody would be interested in being involved in what God is about to do. You know, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. They're not alert, not accustomed of what's going on. They're backslidden, they're careless, they're not involved in what God's doing, and Satan comes along and, and, and captures them. You know, that verse is very interesting to me. Because it says, be sober, be vigilant, not to be careless, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, you know, Satan's not our friend, he's our adversary, because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may, what? Devour. You know, it's really interesting to take note that Satan's not out there to, to eat an ear or to bite off a foot or to bite off a hand or... He's out there to devour. He's out there to destroy, to kill. He's not our friend. He's not our, not somebody to, to uh, have a conversation with and to be comforted around. He's just not our friend. We're to be sober, to be vigilant, not, not, not to be careless, not to be careless in our walk and talk, and, but, but to be watchful, to be alert, to be ready, to win that victory for the glory of God. Gideon was spirit-filled. He knew that it was he that God was going to use. So not only do we want to look at the crowds of compromise and the valleys of fear, but let's also look at in the midst of war. Because here dear Gideon is, he finally realizes that, that God was about to use him. And these men were characterized by courage. They weren't compromisers. They, they weren't covered with fear of the world around them. They, they were characterized by courage. We can do this. We can win this battle. God even told Gideon, he said, Gideon, if you have any questions and you're a little bit concerned, why don't you go down and, 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 and in the dark and stand around the trees and listen to what the Midianites are saying. And so they go down there and one of the Midianites looked at his friend and said, you know, I had a dream last night. It was a dream of this little, little barley loaf rolling into camp and knocking the camp down. And that man said, well, that's not, none other than Gideon and the sword of the Lord. <laughs> and that encouraged Gideon. He said, yep, God's going to do something today. We can win this battle. So he comes back. And he talks to those men who are characterized by courage. And he shares with them just how they're going to win. Of course, they're going to use shotguns and machine guns and cannons and, and uh, may, maybe a couple turbo uh, missiles. Or, but no, no, that's not what they did at all. Didn't even have a gun, no machine gun. They didn't even have a sword. Listen to what their weapons were. Their weapons were a lantern a pitcher, and a trumpet. That's it. That's all they had. And Gideon gathered them together. And when Gideon gathered these men together, in verse 16 of Judges chapter 7, let's look at it here. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers, and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, look on me. This is good. Look at what he says. He says, look on me. Follow me. Follow my lead and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. Follow my lead. Could you imagine these Israelites circling around the Midianite army? And one says, hey, I think I'm going to start now. It would have messed everything up. He said, no, follow my lead. Let's put this together. Let's do it the way God wants us to do it. Follow my lead. And that's what we need to do with our pastor. Is to follow the lead of our leader, the pastor. For one purpose. That we might be united. For a purpose of battle. For a purpose to win. And verse 8, 18. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, 
Then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So here they've got their weapon. A trumpet, a pitcher, and a lantern. And this is how it went. They put the lanterns within the pitcher so that the Midianite army could not see them circling around the camp. And when the timing was right, and Gideon gave the call, must be raining outside. Somebody's been praying for rain. Just what we need, right? There we go. Yes, that's why it's so hot in here. It's 76 degrees humidity. I mean, 76% humidity. There we go. There we go. So, so here's the way it went. When the timing was right, they broke the pitchers which woke everybody up. And when they come running out of their tents, they saw these lanterns circling around the whole camp. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, made them so disquieted. And then they blew with the trumpets. Now you got to remember that these trumpets in Israel, one trumpet represented a thousand men. Now get the picture here. These are supposed to be the leaders of the army. And each band of a thousand men had one leader who blew a trumpet. And when these trumpets blew, as far as the Midianites were concerned, there weren't just 300 men circled around them, but 300,000 men were circled around them as far as they were concerned. They were so disquieted, so afraid, that they drew their sword and killed everyone around them. They destroyed their own army. Could you imagine that? Oh, Fred, I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they killed their own army. Destroyed it. Oh, there are a few that ran and got away. But Israel chased after them and destroyed them as well. Let's look at it. Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pictures that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pictures and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets and in their right hand to blow with all. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled and the 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow even throughout all the host and the host fled in Besheta the Zerite and to the border of Abel Mahalai onto Tabith and the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Nifla and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters onto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters onto Bethbara and Jordan. And they took two princesses of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they blew Oreb upon the rock, or slew Oreb upon the rock, Oreb and Zeb. They slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. They won the battle with only 300 men. Wow. The Bible tells us in Judges chapter 8 verse 10. About 15,000 men. All that were left of all the host of the children of the east. For there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. In Judges chapter 7, verse 15, Gideon worshipped, went into battle. Worship, but do not go to battle. That is hypocrisy. But go to battle, but do not worship. That is idolatry. Gideon won the battle. He won the battle with only 300 men. Gideon was a man who was spirit-filled. A desire to live for him. A desire to see what God was about to do. The question is, 
Are we brothers and sisters, saints, that are dominated by fear, characterized by compromise? Are we filled with courage that only comes from above? We need to take a stand against a world who hates everything about God, hates everything that we believe to be true in God's word. We need to take a stand. Don't be dominated by fear, but characterized with courage. A courage to stand up for what's right. A courage to stand up for what God's word has to teach and the principles of God's word. And there's so many things we can stand up for. We can stand against abortion and, and all the things that we see in the world around us and, and the fear, the fear that we see in the world, that a fear for the unknown, that we could be full of joy and peace, knowing that God is sitting on the throne, that one day our Savior is going to return and we're going to be victorious, just like Gideon was victorious. Gideon won the battle because he put God first. He was spirit-filled a desire to live for the Lord and to serve him with all his heart. And you know, as you look at Gideon, you see a man who's the youngest one in his family, the smallest tribe of Israel, but yet God used him in a mighty way. God does not always use the one that we think is the most qualified. He uses the one who's willing to be used of God, who steps up and says, Lord, here am I, send me. Gideon, a man who was spirit-filled, that God used in a mighty way. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God today, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at the fact that God's will is so clear that, yes, you must be born again. You want us to be a part of the family of God. And Father, I pray if there's one here that's not a part of the family of God, that you make it so clear in their lives. Make it so clear that today they need to make that choice to accept Christ as their personal Savior. But also pray that it will be our desire to be Spirit-filled. Not that we need more of the Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit needs more of us. Not to be compromised by fear. Not to be compromised by, by the things of this world, but to be characterized by courage. To have a desire to live and to serve you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother, you come. If you would, stand and turn to hymn number 162. And if you have a special prayer request or somebody you want to pray for, please come up and pray. It's open up here. Something about publicly. Just seals it. 162. <clears throat> I'm 
coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming. On the last, my soul is sick, my heart is sore. Now I'm coming home, my strength renew, my hope restore. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord. I'm coming home. Amen. Please bow your hearts with me. Father God, we thank you so much for today. Thank you for all the love and the fellowship that is, is gathered here today in your name. And uh, please help us to take this message home with us and, and, and to think about it and to set it in our hearts and so that we can go out and be the light and the salt of the earth for you and uh, just bring him in, the ones that need, that need our guidance to help them find you, Lord. And, that is the pur our purpose in this church, and we thank you for that opportunity and the freedom to do that. Please keep us all safe throughout the week. Bring us all back tonight for another message and, and for more food. And We just love you so much, Father. And uh, we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. You are dismissed.